Hi everybody, it is your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we're continuing our third unit on cellular energetics by getting into topic 3.3, which is on environmental impact on enzyme function. So in our last video, we discussed enzyme structure and enzyme catalysis. What are enzymes and what do they do and how exactly do they work? All right, so today what we're gonna be talking about are some other factors that might affect an enzyme's ability to do its job. And if you remember from the last video, an enzyme's job is to lower the activation energy or lower the amount of energy that's required for a reaction to happen. And reactions in the body and in living things, they happen in pathways. One thing gets converted to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. All right, um, so in order for an enzyme to do its job, it's dependent on Really, it's more than this, but we're going to stick to four today. Uh, four environmental factors. The temperature, the pH of the reactions, the concentration of both the substrate and the enzyme, and what are called inhibitors, which we'll talk about towards the end of the video. Um, and something I'd just like to point out here is that, you know, enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are proteins, which means that they have a very, very particular shape. They are have a sequence of amino acids that fold and interact with each other just the right way to form just the right shape for just the right substrate. So they're very, very, very specific. Um, and they can get messed up if they're not in the right conditions. Um, and something happens to the bonds that allow these uh, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets to maybe fold improperly or the tertiary structure and the side chain interactions to get messed up. So they're very picky right? Uh, so we're going to talk about four different uh, factors that might mess up enzyme function and or just change enzyme function in the first place. Um, and the first is called, well, it's, it, it's temperature. Um, increasing temperature increases overall reaction rate. So if you know this from a physical class, uh, heat and thermal energy is really just a measure of how much individual particles of matter are moving around. Because no matter what it is, unless it's at absolute zero, Particles and matter are moving around, especially if they're in fluids or, or if they're fluids as in like a liquid or a gas, All right? And the thing about uh, these particles when they're flying around like this is that they're crashing into each other all the time. And by increasing the temperature, you are increasing the speed of these particles, okay? So that's really what heat is, or I should say that's a re really what temperature is. Let me catch myself there. It's a measure of how much kinetic energy the particles have, how much they're moving around, okay? So substrate, ooh, substrates are more likely to collide with the active sites of enzymes more frequently if they're moving around faster and if they're colliding with each other and with the enzymes uh, much more frequently. So if I were to raise the temperature of the whatever this is over here, okay, I would maybe speed up the, the uh, individual molecules themselves and that would result in more collisions. But here's the thing about temperature. While temperature generally raises the reaction rate, allows reactions to happen more quickly, um, too high of a temperature can break the interactions that maintain the protein shape. And remember, enzymes are finicky. They're very specific, and they're, they're maybe even a little fragile. Um, so too high of a temperature for an enzyme can cause the enzyme to change shape and thus lose its function, and that's called denaturation. So let's take a look at denaturation. Um, the definition of denaturation is that a protein loses shape due to a disruption of weak chemical bonds and becoming inactive. So take a look at this picture over here. We have a fully functional folded, nice convoluted protein um, but if it becomes denatured due to maybe excess heat or maybe too low of a pH, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, what, happen is, what happens is maybe the hydrogen bonds and the side chain interactions that hold the protein together at the secondary and tertiary level, they're no longer able to function. Um, so what happens is that this protein becomes all messed up. It can, becomes unfolded, and this denatured protein is useless unless it can be I'm not sure if this is a word, renatured, um, because in some cases, denatured proteins, this denaturation process can sometimes be reversible. Um, and so in some cases, a denatured protein can go back and refold into a functional protein. But the point is here is that if the temperature becomes too high, those hydrogen bonds and those side chain interactions that hold the shape of the protein are going to get messed up. And then when they do get messed up, it's called denaturation. And the protein, and thus the enzyme, 
cannot function. It cannot do its job. So enzymes have what we call an optimal, optimal temperature and pH range. Enzymes tend to work best in certain temperatures and certain pHs, and that depends on what the job of the enzyme is or where it is, say, like in the human body. We're going to take a look at ex an example of how this can be variable here in just a minute. So check it out. pH, just like temperature, pH stands for power of hydrogen, and it's really just a measure of the hydrogen concentration. So if you don't know that, please make sure you have that written down somewhere. pH is just a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. That can cause denaturation too. Too many hydrogen ions, too, uh, too high of a concentration of hydrogen ions, or what we could just call protons, can interfere with protein shape and hydrogen bonding, much like temperature can. Okay, so these hydrogen ions can get in the way of those hydrogen bonds and really mess things up, destroy the shape of the protein, and thus denature it. Um, but what I was saying before is that certain enzymes, and there's a lot, there's a wide variety of enzymes because there's a huge wide variety of uh, reactions, right? Enzymes, different enzymes have different ranges of temperature and different ranges of pH that they work best in. So for example, if we take a look at the digestive system, all right, your digestive system, I referenced this in the first video, its job is to break down food in, so that we can extract energy from it and break it down into small molecules so that we can, our cells can take those small molecules and build us, right? Molecules that are going to be helpful to our bodies. Um, but in order to do that, we have a wide range of enzymes that allow that to happen. So amylase, this is a type of enzyme that's found in your spit. Right, your your spit is constantly producing it. Your salivary glands it constantly has amylase, and that's going to break down some carbohydrates. Um, the optimal pH for amylase is seven. It's seven, so right in a neutral pH, just like where water is at. Um, but then, as we go from the mouth down to the esophagus and into the stomach, we find pepsin. And pepsin's job, one of ma pepsin's main job, is to work together with hydrochloric acid in your stomach to break down proteins. And the optimal pH for pepsin, it's two, okay? So that's a way more acidic environment um, than in your mouth, right? But pepsin wouldn't work at a pH of seven. And amylase would not work at a pH of two. So it's different enzymes are optimized for different pHs. And finally, trypsin, which is a protein that you can find in your, or an enzyme that you can find in your intestines, particularly your colon, um, it works best at a slightly basic pH, at a pH of 8, okay? So none of these would work, like pepsin's not going to work in your mouth, amylase isn't going to work in your stomach, pepsin's not going to work in your intestines, and, you know, you get the idea. Enzymes are optimized for certain pH ranges and certain temperatures, right? Um, we're going to talk later this year about what's called a PCR reaction or a polymerase chain reaction. And an enzyme that's required to do a PCR, which is just making a bajillion copies of DNA, um, comes from an organism that lives in like a super hot, hundreds of degrees Celsius environment. Um, but it has enzymes that allow it to make copies of DNA. So we're going to talk about that later on. Um, but anyway, another factor that affects enzyme function is both substrate concentration, I don't know where I can put my face, um, and enzyme concentration. So kind of like the, if we're talking about collisions from before, a higher substrate concentration, more substrate is going to increase reaction rate. Why? Well, because they're running into each other more. If there's, there's a higher concentration, as this picture shows, there's going to be more collisions between the individual particles, and there's going to be more collisions between the enzyme and the substrate, right? But that comes to a certain point. Um, if there's not enough, if, there, if you overload the substrate and you don't add any more enzyme, uh, then their reaction rate is limited because you only have a certain amount of enzyme. Remember, enzymes only have one active site. So here's, here's the enzyme, here's the substrate, then the products are made and it comes out, right? So if we have a bunch of substrate but not a bunch of enzyme concentration, then there might not be enough active sites um, for all that substrate to be, you know, to be reacting at a faster rate. And that's what we call saturation, okay? Um, but here's the other thing. The reverse is also true. If you increase enzyme concentration, yeah, that will increase reaction rate to a point. But then if you have, you know, too much enzyme and not enough substrate, then there's going to be some enzymes with some empty active sites for a while. And their reaction is going to only be so 
fast or it's going to be only so efficient um, at a certain point where you know the enzyme concentration is going to be matched up with the substrate concentration. Right? So increasing both of these will generally increase the reaction rate, but only up to a point, depending, and they're dependent on each other. So there are substrate specific, or there are substrate limited reactions, and then there are enzyme limited reactions as well. Um, so two more factors here, or really one more factor that affects enzyme function, they're called inhibitors. And the inhibitors are molecules that stop, or in another word, inhibit the action of specific enzymes. And you betcha, inhibitors are very specific as well. Um, so we got two different types of inhibition. So if enzyme A is, and enzyme B are trying to act on this substrate over here, they're trying to react it, um, an inhibitor is going to come and ruin that enzyme's day. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it can be a bad thing, but I'll talk about why this is a good thing that inhibition can happen here. Um, so we got two types of inhibitors. One is called a com competitive inhibitor, and that's like over in this picture here with enzyme A, um, it blocks substances from entering the active site. So here's an inhibitor molecule. It just comes right into the active site and does not allow subs the substrate to bind to the active site. Pretty simple, right? They're both competing for the active site. That's why it's called competitive inhibition. But a non-competitive inhibitor does not bind to the active site, and it binds to another place on the enzyme that's called the allosteric site. Um, and what might cause that to happen or what might cause the inhibition, is that this inhibitor causes a conformation change in the protein or a shape change in the protein. And thus the active site might not be the right shape anymore for that substrate to bind, right? So the inhibitor might cause a change in shape of protein and the substrate won't be able to bind. This active site is open, but the active site no longer fits for that substrate. So it's also inhibiting, even though it's not blocking the active site, um, it's also inhibiting that reaction from happening. All right. Uh, so one last thing about allosteric or allosteric regulation, enzymatic reactions. Remember how I said they're not always a bad thing. Most oftentimes they're a good thing. We can't have all these reactions if all of your enzymes were uninhibited. All those reactions were happening simultaneously would be chaos, and it just wouldn't make any sense at all. It would be extremely inefficient and energy wouldn't be used properly. So enzymatic reactions are regulated. They're controlled by inhibitors. Um, and one of your ways that, uh, that living things are going to do that is through allosteric regulation. And that's involving affecting a protein's function by binding to a separate site or the allosteric site. All right, so it's very important that enzymes are regulated because if all of them were going, nothing good would happen, right? So in order for that metabolic pathway a very specific series of steps to, or, in, to happen, okay, enzymes need to be controlled, and that rate at which enzymes are reacting need to be controlled as well. Right? So one of your body's main ways of, bleh, ways of maintaining homeostasis is making sure your temperature is at the right spot. It's making sure pH is regulated so that these enzymatic reactions can happen. All right, so if you're in my anatomy and physiology class, it's like, oh, this is what homeostasis regulates. And really, the function of enzymes is why um, a lot of those factors need to be regulated. All right, that is it for this video. I got kids coming to class soon, so I'll uh, see you later. Let me know if you have any questions.